This is Witchbase News for Friday the 10th of May 2024. I'm Commander Burr. In Elite Dangerous News this week Patch 1804 supercruises into the game bringing with it the much anticipated Python Mark 2. Arc store price rises send ripples through the community. The Elite Dangerous web store gets a very welcome refresh and the engineering leash comes off Achilles SEO drives. You know how this bit goes please like, subscribe and ding that little bell so that YouTube shows you all our content and if you'd like to directly help our work here at the Burr Pit you can also support us through Patreon. Links to that and everything else are in the description below. It's been a busy couple of weeks for Elite Dangerous as we see Frontier starting to focus on the important task of ensuring the profitability of Elite Dangerous into the future. It was always going to be a controversial time for the game to weather and, together with the advent of paid for ships, this week also saw a price increase in the cost of cosmetic items from the ARC store. A subtle warning was issued ahead of time toward the end of April that changes to the ARC pricing structure were on their way in May so price increases were not entirely unexpected but it's the amount of some of the price increases in particular that sent a collective shudder through much of the community. Galnet News Digest provided an excellent breakdown of the numbers involved and I've linked to that video in the description below if you want to scrutinise the details. Whilst some prices increased by 20% other prices doubled and more. The previously more exclusive paint jobs such as Midnight Black which is great to see now available all year round increased by 275% and of course it's these increases that sadly generated the most headlines. It is of course important to remember none of these items are necessary to play the game and that Elite does in fact give away a regular flow of paint jobs, decals and ship kits just for watching live streams on Twitch or participating in community wide events such as CG's and Titan Assaults. Interestingly ARCs themselves have of late also become an earnable reward in game over and above the 400 ARCs limit per week just for regularly contributing gameplay that we'd become used to. It's likewise interesting to note that the same press release that quietly mentioned price changes coming to the store that was published in late April also mentions ARCs being earnable through future community event participation and in the Powerplay 2.0 presentation that Arthur hosted on the last Frontier Unlocked livestream earnable ARCs were also shown in some work in progress images that sketched out in loose terms the rewards that would be available for positioning on the leaderboard in Powerplay when that system launches later this year. We're wondering here if the ARCs store increases are part of a wider strategy that aims to make ARCs more easily earnable through regular play for the more long term player. Whilst the more casual or even dip in once or twice and never return again style of player will likely pay more in real money terms for the arcs that they want. An argument could be made therefore that the hardcore player is monetized but importantly rewarded very differently to the short term player. We'll have to see how this plays out in the long run before we'll know for sure however. Until we get further clarification from FDEV the increased prices will, for the moment perhaps, still give some players a moment of pause when staring longingly at the ARC store but if FDEV's plans are to give the long term player more opportunity to earn ARCs through specific targeted gameplay then it could actually work out to benefit the players that stick around longer. The ARC store price rises from our previous item are of course just part of the story around the greater monetization of Elite Dangerous this week and we were pleased to see the game striding further into a realm that it has, by all outward appearances at least, been somewhat nervous of in the many years up until this point. With the deployment of patch 1804 this week arrived the first new ship to enter the game since the Mamba and the Crate Phantom landed in December of 2018, nearly five and a half years ago. Whilst the ship is in the game right now, in order to access it before August the 7th you'll need to pay Frontier at least 16,520 arcs to get in on the newly introduced early access program. After August the 7th the ship will be freely available in the game for credits just like any other ship. 
If you missed our first look at the Python Mark II then you'll find it linked on screen now. Frontier even created their own 30 second cinematic style trailer for the ships premiere complete with smooth camera moves and rocky electric guitar soundtrack. This is the first new trailer we've seen for any element of the game since the arrival of the Stargoids and it was really good to see FDev returning to using completely in game footage for what is a really punchy bold confident trailer. If you want to show the game and the ship off in 30 seconds or less this is absolutely the way to do it. That's also linked below if you want to give it a watch. Alongside the early access pass for the Python Mark II also new this week was the first of the pre-built ship packs. As we mentioned in our previous video on the subject from a close look at the pre-builds it's very apparent they're designed to act as a leg up for newer players or those with very little time to play, quickly dismissing any fears of truly genuine pay to win mechanics entering the game at this stage. The ships come with very minimal engineering or unlocks and those unlocked or engineered modules cannot be transferred to another ship. If you want to access any more of the engineering or unlocked modules that come with the ships you'll still need to go through the engineering and unlocking process through regular gameplay. It's an interesting first step for Frontier granting access to a taster of Elite's deeper gameplay potential to show what is possible without going too far in throwing the door wide open in exchange for access to the players wallet. 1804 wasn't just about pre-built ships and Mark II pythons however. One of the bigger complaints that came with the advent of the new Super Cruise overcharge capable frameshift drives a few weeks back was the inability to engineer the modules. 1804's deployment has swept all that away however. Not only are the SCO drives now fully engineerable in exactly the same way as the previous generation of FSDs they are also now available in all the same variety, flavour, sizes, grades and colours as the previous generation and they provide slightly more range once they're engineered than most of the older FSDs from the Sirius Corporation the exception being a tech broker unlocked pre-engineered FSD with a mass manager experimental effect added but even then the difference isn't hugely game changing. The arrival of the next gen Achilles SCO capable FSD has, to all intents, made the Sirius FSDs of old completely obsolete overnight. When you're outfitting and engineering a new ship at the very least there is literally no reason now to choose the Sirius frameshift drive. You might not feel the need to use the SCO capability on the ship and in a lot of cases that is absolutely true but if you're outfitting a new ship you might as well have it if it's available as it comes with no downsides when you're not using it. There are increased calls within the community for FDev to add a scrapping mechanic for engineered modules that would allow at least some of the materials used in the engineering of a module to be recovered and recycled so that they can be reused by those commanders that would now like to upgrade their fleet of existing but now obsolete Sirius Tech frameshift drives. One such call from Dry Heat and Sand on YouTube explaining how the system might work you can find linked below. The patch did deliver a wobble or two as well. For a short period it did seem like the Thargoid war might be coming to a rapid conclusion as Thargoid control influence was dropping like a rock but that issue was fixed and everything set back to how it should be after some slightly extended downtime on Thursday. At the time of recording there is still an issue when trying to swap a stored module into the Python Mark II. FDev are aware of the problem and there is a simple workaround. I've linked to the relevant forum thread on that issue below this video. The patch also delivered a number of fixes and balances perhaps most notable of which was the issue of Super Cruise overcharge heat generation being linked to frame rates. That issue is now squashed but rather than replicate the entire list of changes, fixes and additions that came with the patch I've linked to the patch notes below this video if you're curious to see them. If you haven't already noticed be sure to watch the new Fancy Dan animated splash screen that springs up after you hit play on the loader. It was great to see the thought put into refreshing something so familiar and the new splash screen better reflects the breadth of activities available in the game as well as tugging heavily on the nostalgia strings opening as it does with a Cobra Mark III cruising towards a Coriolis starport. And 
Bang on cue to underline and reinforce Elite's new boulder monetization awareness, the Elite Dangerous web store got a much welcome refresh and revamp this week making it significantly more usable and easier to navigate and find what you're looking for. It comes now with a starship database that lists every single ship in the game and allows for three ships to be compared side by side. It's not as comprehensive and detailed as a third party tool such as Coriolis or the Elite Dangerous Shipyard but it does give the much less experienced and newer player an idea at least of what they might be looking for in a ship and what other options are available to them without overwhelming them with more minute details that might not yet be relevant to them. It's been another huge week in the life of Elite Dangerous in a year where it's rapidly been stacking up on huge weeks. There have long been calls in the wider community including from this channel for the game to monetize itself more effectively in order for it to better secure its own future. Frontier have previously appeared reticent to exploit their flagship genre defining space trader but whilst it's not impossible for a live service game to exist largely on box sales alone it certainly is much harder for that same game to expand, grow and satisfy the needs of a long term player base if it chooses that path. There is of course a balance to be found when monetizing players and as I'm sure we're all too aware as gamers it's all too often the case that the helter skelter slides to game progression are often opened up enthusiastically when presented with a suitably fat bank account. Doing so devalues the player experience for everyone involved and artificially turns explorable depths rapidly into shallows. With that in mind however it's crucial for that same long term health and sustainability that Elite Dangerous brings in new blood and then keeps those players on board as much as possible. Some of Elite's bigger plus points for me are ironically also its weaker points for new players. That of the huge learning cliff and schooling in hard knocks that the game presents and the sheer vast scale of the game especially to the newer player. The jump start and pre built ships are a toe in the water to go some way towards tackling those new player problems whilst also helping to forward fund the game. If you're just starting out they can give you a leg up but they're not so powerful a boost that you'll leapfrog over those players that learnt the hard way. They give the merest hint of what more is possible with a ship using systems like engineering and tech broker unlocks etc. Interestingly the super cruise overcharge velvet revolution that is happening in the game speaks to these same easing the pain goals that Elite seems to be edging towards. Long super cruise times were part and parcel of the Elite Dangerous experience 10 years ago but Elite doesn't exist in a vacuum and what might seem immersive and cool to one player can rapidly become an impediment to fun for another. Super Cruise Overcharge strikes a nice balance I think between skipping what can be long dead game time whilst still maintaining the size and scope of the galaxy something that intra system hyperspace jumps for example perhaps wouldn't achieve quite so well. In this 40th year for the franchise and the 10th year for this iteration of Elite the current refreshing of the games monetization options, the spring cleaning and updating of its web presence, a new splash screen on loading and the introduction of a more dynamic and dare I say it less pedestrian Super Cruise experience feels like part of a much welcome shot in the arm that the game could use at this point in its long life. Taken in context with the refresh of power play, the introduction of at least 4 new ships this year, the expected changes to engineering and the still as yet unannounced new feature coming to the game after power play 2.0 it feels like this really could well be the start of a bold new exciting era for Elite as a product and as a franchise. What do you think of the changes to Super Cruise Overcharge? Would you like to see a scrapping mechanic for unwanted engineered modules and did you buy early access to the Python Mark II this week? Let us know in the comments below. That's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back later this week with more videos. Until then 07 CMDRs follow the greens on the way out and do keep clear of the toast rack. We very much look forward to seeing you next time.